Hi, welcome back to History of the English Language, episode 10, Old English Morphology. I know you've all been excited for this one. Um, here on the screen, you can see King Alfred of Wessex, who is uh, called Alfred the Great. And for one reason he's called Alfred the Great is because he repelled a Viking, uh, well, he didn't repel, but he held off a, a Danish invasion, keeping them to conquering the east of England, uh, east of England with implications for the English language that we will discuss next week, um, but also with the implication that English survived. And he also um, uh, introduced uh, educational programs and uh, monastic cultural production programs that uh, ensured that there was an abundance of Old English texts that survived. Uh, one of the, the, the upshots of this is that the forms that we're going to be looking at today, the forms of nouns and adjectives and pronouns and articles, are largely the dialect of Old English known as West Saxon. Most of the texts that survives, that survive are in the West Saxon dialect spoken in Wessex, which is a compound of West Saxon. Um, so let's talk about morphology. I know, I know, it's, it's exciting. Uh, what's a phrase? A phrase, just to review, is a group of words that work together that function equivalently as one word. So for example, you have a verb phrase, and walk is a verb, but it's also a verb phrase. And if I say, I walk, walk is a verb phrase. If I say, I walk with my friend to the store while she's uh, petting her dog and I'm talking on my phone, all of that is a verb phrase too, because that whole chunk is substitutable for walk or ride or drive or whatever. So that's a phrase. A noun phrase is, is, works the same, right? A noun is, let's say, stone right? Like a stone on the ground. The mossy stone, which my friend gave to me yesterday, still all a noun phrase, right? Still all chunked within that noun. Um, okay, so noun phrases. Let's talk about Old English morphology here and, and about what we can expect from noun phrases. Uh, Old English is a more complicated inflectional morphology than modern English. If that, if you don't, if you're not understanding that at the moment, um, uh, then you will by the end of this video, I hope. But what it basically means is that, um, just like we have pronouns that change form according to case, gender, and number, he, him, she, it, they, them. Um, in Old English, nouns change form too according to case, gender, and number. In this respect, the Old English noun more closely resembles the case system of modern Germanic languages like German or Danish or Norwegian or Swedish. Substantives is um, a word that's sometimes used to describe particularly nouns and adjectives. And so nouns, pronouns, demonstratives, um, which includes the article, uh, the, this, that are all demonstratives, um, all have four cases. And if you've studied Latin at all, you know what a case is, and you're probably, maybe maybe you're a little traumatized by it, by having to go, you know, agricola, 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 agricolam, agricola, because you were made to remember the different cases of the noun. Cases are forms, often endings ended, uh, appended to a stem, that indicate the function of a noun in a sentence, uh, such as subject, direct object, indirect object, or possessive, and met, there's many other functions as well. There's like instrument, location, there's all different um, things that a noun can be doing in a sentence. Um, there are four cases in Old English. There is the nominative case, and this, is this, this indicates the subject of a sentence from the Latin word nomen, meaning name. There is the genitive case, which, in, which indicates pos the possessive. And in fact, the modern English possessive S is actually the survival of the Old English genitive, which usually used an S. So like Jonathan's, that's a case ending that's zzz at the end there. Uh, and we think of it as a, as a suffix because of the printer con printing convention of using an apostrophe. No, but it's a case ending. It's a, it's a modification of the word. Uh, genitive it can also be used to indicate material, a sword of iron, and can indicate um, what's called the objective or subjective gen genitive, or it's attached to a uh, a noun that has a verbal force, like for example, love is we, is a noun, but the na but it names an act or a, or, or a doing, right? So a love of learning is an example. That of learning is an example of an objective genitive phrase. Um, the dative is uh, the case that indicates the indirect object. Um, as in, I gave the ball to my friend, and the word dative comes from a Latin word dodare 
meaning to give. So there's that idea that, um, the indir- that the dative indicates the indirect object or the beneficiary. Um, and then there's the accusative. Uh, and, they, and the root word of accusative is the same as the root word in percussion, um, which is to strike, right? So it's the thing that the action hits, the direct object. Um, it can also indicate direction, as in I'm going home. The word home in Old English would be um, indicated by the accusative case sometimes if it's not put into a pronoun phrase. Um, so let's talk about Old English pers- and Old English personal pronouns. And I'm going to hold off on talking about um, using cases versus pro- um, pronoun phrases because that gets into syntax, which is the object of the, the next week's work. Um, so let's talk about pronouns. Everyone's talking about pronouns these days. It's a big topic. Let's talk about the Old English pronoun where we have three genders. Oh my goodness. Um, there's a singular, uh, there's a, a accusative, there's a, 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 a masculine, feminine, and neuter gender. Um, but that's only in the third person. In the first person, we have a uh, common gender, it's called. It's, there's a, that the first person is I or we, second person is you or you all, and the third person is he or she or they or them, if you're using that, uh, and then um, the uh, uh, they or them plural as well. So let's let's look at this, okay? This is a big t- informa- uh, information. There's a lot of data here, but let's make some sense of it in order to figure out um, what is similar to modern English and what is different from modern English, what we have kept, what we have gotten rid of, uh, what is distinctive about Old English, and what connects Old English to other Germanic languages. Let's look at the first person nominative, the subject pronoun, I, is in Old English, each, which is equivalent to in the modern German, ich, right? And then the genitive, which we said is the possessive, is mein, right? Like modern English, mine. Um, the dative and the accusative are both may, may, but we sometimes see mech in the accusative as well. Um, in the, the, uh, the, that's the singular, right? And then in the plural, it's we, ora, us, us. That sounds pretty fam- similar to we, our, us, right? The, this, this hasn't changed very much at all. Um, the pronoun systems tend to, to be conservative in the sense that they're slowly changing, which is one of the reasons why linguists, u- historical linguists, using the comparative method, um, look at pronouns as, as uh, uh, to compare languages and, and track de- descent. Um, what is this dual business? Well, in, old Germ- in, in Indo-European languages, before Old English, most um, languages had a dual form, which means not one, not many, but two, right? There's a specific form for two. Uh, and and in, in Old English, it was wit, unker, uncher, unch, unch, unche. And then the second is yit, incher, inch, inchit, right? So that would just refer to two people. There's no third person dual, though. That had dropped out by Old English. Um, you don't find these too much in West's in West Saxon texts. Actually, these tend to be common in earlier texts, which are often inscriptional. Um, so let's look at the second person, thou, which you might recognize from Shakespearean English as thou, right? The, the thou is the singular, and later the informal you, thou, vin, the, they, or in early modern English, thou, thine, thee, thee. Right? So this survives for a while, if not um, more to the present day. And then the plural is ye. Remember that a G, uh, from the last video, that a G before a high or a front vowel is pronounced like a ye. So ye, 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 ye generation of vipers, right? Eor, eor, eo, 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 no, no. Eo, eo, or ewich is the accusative. So I, Ye are cool. Is that your parking spot? Um, I'm giving this to you. Hey, I see ew, right? And you can see how that 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 diphthong there, ew, how the first vowel eventually got simplified to the semi-vowel ye. It's because of, for because of the principle of ease of articulation. It's all coming together. All right, that's the uh, second person, and then in the third person we have in the singular masculine, hey, his, him. Whoa, that's almost exactly the same, except we have this accusative case, hinna. Heu, hira, hira, he, that's the feminine. Heu is the feminine. So he is the masculine, 
who is the feminine. That could get a little confusing. And sure enough, later in the Middle English period, who will be replaced by the form she, which is actually borrowed from Old Norse, which we'll talk about. And then the singular neuter, hit, his, him, hit. And that hit, the H will drop out eventually and it will become it. The plural Old English third person is he, hira, him, he. He, hira, he. And this will be almost entirely replaced by the Old Norse uh, third person plural pronoun, those notorious culprits of so much recent controversy, they, them, their. Thank you, Vikings, for those awesome pronouns. All right, let's move on from pronouns then uh, so we don't make this video too long. All of this is meant to support and explain material that you can find in any old history of the English language textbook. Uh, it's in chapter four, section, uh, chapter four uh, of your um, uh, Van Gelderen uh, History of the English Language, if that's the textbook you're using as we are in my class here at Missouri State. The demonstratives. Uh, let's talk about demonstratives. What's a demonstrative? You may have heard of a demonstrative pronoun like this or that, or what are those? Um, sorry, very, very old meme. Demonstrative articles. Uh, demonstratives include demonstrative pro adjectives, but they also include articles. Um, and in, in linguistics, these are both together uh, grouped under the category of determiner. So in um, the Old English, we had se, tha, tham, I think it's actually, this should actually be, uh, ah, uh, the dative should be fam too, but se, thas, fam, thona. So, fara, fara, tha. Fat, thas, fam, fat. And the plural, tha, thara, fam, tha. Whoa. Okay, so in English we have the word the, pretty much. In Old English, we have it's these 16 different forms of the, which is very similar to modern German. One of the, one of the things that makes learning German tricky uh, for English speakers, where we're not used to this kind of thing. Learning German will be much easier for a Dutch speaker, where they all already have that category for different uh, um, declensions, different uh, form, morphological forms of uh, the the article. Now, there's no difference between the article and the demonstrative pronoun. So, like, th the um, also means that. So, these could be used in combination with nouns. So, you know, um, neuter, that shipu, that ship, right? Or um, it, these could be used alone. So could just mean this one, right? Or, or him or he, right? Uh, but it would be more likely to just refer to a non-person since personal pronouns, they're, they're there to refer to people. These are more likely to refer to things and will agree with the thing that they're referring to, the gender of the noun that they're referring to, even if um, the noun itself isn't named, it's been dropped because it's already been talked about. Um, so uh, a little bit more about substantives. Substantives are nouns and adjectives. And in a noun phrase, each element that um, will agree in case, gender, and number. This is where the rubber hits the road, and I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna sort of give you a little demonstration about how these cases work in Old English. Um, let's say, let's take the, ver the noun phrase, the good stone. The good stone rolls downhill. Here it's the subject. So the good stone, that noun phrase is gonna be nominative. This is a piece of the good stone, then it's gonna be genitive. I leave a flower on. The good stone, going to be dative. I see the good stone, or I throw the good stone, or I heat up the good stone, all accusative. Ben, I'm, I'm, I borrowed this example from an older, uh, um, well, that's still around, but it's more expensive, so I don't assign it, the Bow and Cable History of the English Language, which is kind of the classic standard. Um, there are several declensions or paradigms of substantives grouped into strong and weak. Um, you can read about this in Van Gelderen on 64 to 67. Strong ad adjectives are used when there is no demonstrative. Good boys um, will use a strong verb form of good uh, versus those good boys in which good will be have a different declensional pattern, a different way that it'll uh, take the case endings and it'll be weak. Why are they called strong and weak? 
not for anything really specific to them. That's what they were named by philologists in the 19th century who seemed to be going on the principle that the more complicated it was, the more old school Indo-European was, and in some cases, the more Germanish it was, um, the more strong it was. Uh, so there's real no kind of meaning to strong and weak. It's just a way of distinguishing two classes of things. Okay, old English noun phrases. By the way, if, if, you're, wa if you're still watching, I'm really impressed because this is dry stuff. Um, let's look at the good stone rolls downhill. That will assume the form... If it's just good stone rolls downhill, like you're just like Frankenstein or something, it would be good stan. If it's a weak adjective, it would be se good stan. And, and here we see the use of the demonstrative. The genitive, godis stanis. The weak adjective, thus godan stanis. The strong adjective here, godum stana. Weak adjective, tham godan stana. The accusative, godna stan, thona godan stan. Now you can see there's more distinctions in the strong form of the adjective because it's doing some of the work that's taken over in the weak adjective phrases by, eh, by the um, demonstrative. Uh, as you can see, the, the noun, the adjective, um, and, the, and the determiner, the demonstrative, all agree with each other in case, gender, and number. I'm not here to teach you Old English, but I'm here to teach you the distinguishing characteristics of Old English, what makes it different from later forms of English. And this um, case system drops out in Middle English, uh, which you may be, maybe you'll be thankful for, but if you, know, if you learn a language with a case system, it just goes right into your brain without any effort. I mean, Russian kids learn a, a language where every noun has seven cases. They don't see, they seem to have no more of a problem learning Russian than little baby English speakers have learning English. Human mind's amazing like that. All right, this video is getting up to the maximum that I like to do for um, any one of these videos. So I'm gonna cut it short and then we're gonna talk about verbs in the next video. Why don't you join me?